presented. My name is John Erk. I'm the Director of Development for the Sam M. Walton College of Business, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, Cindy and we all would very much like this to be a conversation, so uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to use the chat. We see that David, Levitt, and Matt have made good use of it already, and you might have seen a note from me or two in there as well. Or you can raise your hand by going down to the reactions button on Zoom and uh, just raise your hand and then we'll be able to call on you to answer any questions as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Matt Waller who will introduce Cindy. And Matt, of course, is the Dean of the Walton College. And one of the things that I admire about Matt is that he is not afraid to do things that are difficult uh, in the university system. And one of those things is to start this business integrity leadership initiative with Cindy. I think it's been barely a year that we've even known Cindy. And when you hear all the progress she's already made with this, it's a testament to her first, but also to Matt for having the courage and the wherewithal to go ahead and make this happen because it's not an easy thing to do as many of you know. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Matt, and you can introduce Cindy. Thank you so much, uh, John, and thank you all for uh, the, for joining us for this today. Um, yeah, we, uh, you know, if you look at the values of the Walton College, <clears throat> integrity is a key part of our values. And yet, when we uh, really looked at it, only about 14% of our students were actually getting a solid uh, education and business ethics as a part of their four-year uh, degree. So uh, we wanted to change that. And um, so one of the ways we did that is we brought on uh, Cindy Moraine, um, who you will hear from in a moment. Um, and Cindy is the founder and executive chair of the Business Integrity Leadership Initiative in the Walton College. Now, her background is phenomenal. Um, you know, she spent 20 years at Walmart and she was their senior vice president, chief ethics and compliance officer for the U.S. and global chief ethics officer as well. Uh, so she has a tremendous amount of experience. If you look at the uh, chat um, and Zoom, I put a link in there to um, the web page on our website that has more information about the Business Integrity Leadership Initiative. And I would encourage you to go there and sign up for her newsletter if you're interested in integrity business uh, ethics. Um, Cindy has been interviewing, uh, doing podcast interviews, video interviews with some of the top experts in the world in business ethics. But the thing that she's done in her short time with us that's most amazing is she has helped us with curriculum. And so as of this semester, starting this semester, 100% um, of the students in the Walton College will get a solid education in business ethics. Um, I personally have learned a lot from Cindy about business ethics. In fact, when I brought her on board, um, I said, you know, I want you to help us as a college make sure we're operating with the highest level of integrity. Of course, we always try to, everyone tries to, um, but uh, she uh, she's really helped us a lot as a college in thinking about that, uh, you know, especially in terms of the education. Um, but we all know this. I mean, everyone who's in business knows how important it is to operate with integrity because if you, you know, one of the most important variables in business is trust. And if you don't have strong business ethics, you lose trust and it will hurt your business. So, um, Cindy, uh, thank you so much for uh, speaking to our alumni uh, group today. Uh, looking Absolutely. forward to hearing from you. 
Well, and thank you, Matt, for that gracious and um, introduction. I, good morning to all of you. I can't tell you how happy I am to be here and how exciting and fun I'm finding all of this work. And I am super excited to be able to share it with all of you today. Um, and cross your fingers if technology works and, and I can um, operate it correctly, this is going to be an interactive uh, presentation where you will also get to uh, participate in some of the ways that the students do. So this is going to be very much a, a show and tell so that you all can participate and see. I'm happy to answer questions along the way. Really do want this to be as interactive as possible, even though we can't be together. So don't hesitate at all to raise your hand and John will be watching that ask a question and and we'll dive right in so let's let's get started uh oh I think I need to be able to share my screen first Jen we were going back and forth with coast host and co-host give us just a sec it's still saying it's disabled it for me Okay, what about now? <laughs> <laughs> Just a sec. Okay, now I can do it. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. All right. So I've got several things up that I'm going to show you, but we're going to start with this presentation here. And I'm going to put it into. slideshow mode. Okay. So we did start um, just over a year ago, I'd say, oh, actually, no, just out a year ago, November and December last year, Matt and I really started talking about it and thinking about it. Um, we really started in earnest in January. So it's, it's, uh, it's right at a year of thinking and planning and about um, 10 months into actually getting started. So first thing that um, we did was we wanted to be able to explain really why we were doing this. And so Matt was kind enough to cut a very short video here that we've shared with everyone. It was really an effort to fulfill something we need in college. And that is business ethics needs to be a key part of what we teach and what we do regardless of the discipline. It's not about a specific department. It's got to be cross-functional. When I first became dean five years ago, I spoke with all faculty. I spoke with companies who recruit from us. I spoke with benefactors. And one of the most common requests was that we instill business integrity and business ethics in everything we do in the college. It needs to be a part of the curriculum even more. So that's why we started this initiative. <laughs> whoops, 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 whoops. Hold on. So I'm, I'm not going to take you through the whole video because it uh, we'll get into it here in the rest of the presentation. But some of you may be thinking, why do we why do we need this integrity leadership initiative? Is this common? Is this something other schools have or don't have? And where do we kind of fit in? So we started with data uh, and doing some research. And uh, in fact, many other universities do have an established comprehensive ethics center. Some of them rest in the business school, but some of them are university wide. Some relevant statistics here for you just to be aware of is that we are one of the top 30 public university business schools, as I'm sure you all know, very proud fact for us. Um, and 74% of them already have um, an established comprehensive business ethics center. Uh, in addition to that, there's about 77% of what we call our aspirant universities, universities we want to be more like. There's 13 um, that we sort of compare ourselves against as, as kind of the what we're reaching for. Um, and 13 out of those 13, 10 of the 13 already have something established um, as a comprehensive business ethics center. Now for our peer universities, only about 38% have. So what we're what we're what we're doing is really coming from in those in the in the, those first two metrics coming I would say from a place of um, of being a bit behind but I will tell you with Matt's leadership and the focus on this right now I am confident that we're going to not only catch up or going to leapfrog over those and actually be one of the top who are as an influential um, top 30 public university with um, uh, a comprehensive ethics center and same for our aspirant universities pretty soon they're going to want to be more like we are on this particular topic. 
it starts with what Matt and you all already know from a great um, foundation in that we already had these epic values to build on. Uh, and integrity was already built in to the professionalism uh, value. So it was great. It was a great starting block. Um, it's already there. It's in writing, but it can't just live on a shelf. And the epic values certainly don't. But the question is really, how do you bring these values to life? How do you really explain to students and other stakeholders what we mean when we say integrity and how do we live that out? So we set up the, uh, the, the goals for the Integrity Leadership Initiative, which is to establish Walton College as both a strategic and influential leader in this space. So we've got a vision statement, a mission statement that focuses a lot on, and I'm going to share with you today and have you interact with some of the thought leadership. Um, and then Matt shared with you a little bit about the education that we're doing there, um, some of the research and the outreach that we'll be doing. And I'm excited today to show you some examples from each of those categories. One of the first things we did um, with Matt's help was set up an academic advisory board that was really across the business school disciplines uh, because what we see is an important factor here is that business integrity and ethics and that type of, of curriculum really be integrated into the curriculum. So we wanted it to be something that sat at the dean's level uh, and across the board for the business school as opposed to being within one of those specifically. We also set up a great staff committee and boy, they have really been helping me out a tremendous amount with gathering data, uh, getting our Let's Talk program that I'll explain to you a little bit more off the ground, getting feedback um, from the undergrads on an integrity credo that the MBAs had already put together. So they have been a tremendous support for me so far. All right, so Matt was telling you a little bit about education and that's where I want to start because the reason we're all here is because of the students. So again, first thing that we did uh, when I started was gather some data on where were we and where was the University of Arkansas in business ethics. And it was about 15% of the undergrads that we were reaching prior to this fall. And it was because it was a requirement only, it was an upper level course, first of all, and it was required only for management majors or management minors. And that's only about 15% of our undergrads. So we set about doing some really quick curricular changes. Whoops. And um, as of this fall, as Matt mentioned, we're now covering 100% of the undergrads. We moved curriculum down into some freshman courses. And then we also are extending it through into the full-time MBA program um, and uh, included some curriculum there and spent two full days talking with the second year MBAs um, about integrity and also the importance of, dis of avoiding discrimination and harassment. And we'll get a little bit more into that as well. So, but in addition to these kind of standalone, you know, direct, uh, uh, parts in the curriculum where they're going to be talking about business integrity. One of the really important aspects of this is that it needs to be integrated throughout in order to be successful. And so what do I really mean by that? Um, what I mean by that is it's going to mean a tremendous amount to students, in my opinion, and carry a lot of weight when in their accounting class, they hear their own accounting professors talking not just about the nuts and bolts of accounting, but hear them also talking about the ethical implications of a particular case if it isn't handled in the right way from an accounting perspective. Same if you're talking about marketing and you're, you know, you're talking about how do you create this great campaign and how do you do this wonderful, wonderful marketing images and who's going to be the audience that you're headed after. And when you stop and sit back and think about examples like Juul, like the e-cigarette company and how that was meant to be a smoking cessation product, but actually through a lot of their marketing ended up being a product that hooked a whole younger generation. Um, on nicotine and cigarettes. And so having that woven into the curriculum by a student's kind of core faculty is really, really meaningful because in a student's journey and in their life, at that point in time, those are some of the most important voices for them that they're really going to wake up and pay attention to. Not that the ethics courses aren't, but the issue is our, our business students should not be graduating from Walton College with this idea that ethics is just this standalone course over here. It's not. It's something that actually will affect them no matter what career they choose. So integrating it through the curriculum is super, super important. 
So in addition to that, we've also done a lot to start um, putting a stake in the ground and getting our name known out there externally through a, through a lot of thought leadership. And um, we've done a number of things. I won't go into detail on all of these here, but one that I am going to highlight in particular as we go throughout this uh, presentation is this really important co collaboration on the creation of digital ethical AI curriculum, artificial intelligence. Um, it's really on the cutting edge and the forefront of where this whole field of business ethics is going to go into the future. So what we're doing is working in conjunction with um, Notre Dame, um, University of Virginia, and Duquesne with the help of the Deloitte Foundation to create some digital ethical AI curriculum that essentially could be broadly dispersed to universities so that they would have a framework for using to educate their students um, and even beyond business schools. It can be, you know, sometimes information systems rests in different parts of a university and same for engineering, but it will be a curriculum that can be used, um, we hope, more broadly across, uh, across the universities. So we've also created a fair amount of thought leadership ourselves here at the university. So step one was create a presence in a number of external uh, universe, um, organizations, but then also create our own thought leadership presence. So we set about creating um, the website, which is featured here on this slide and also Matt put it in the chat, but then also creating uh, platforms across all the social media channels so that um, stakeholders, uh, alumni, other business leaders, students, faculty, everyone could engage and cross whatever platform they wanted to. And then we also set about creating a number of videos and podcasts. We've done about, um, I count the full slate that's for this semester, we've got about 24 now. We release them once a week and you're going to get to hear some snippets from some of those. Uh, and then we also turn them into videos. So they're basically video podcasts because video is really picking up in terms of a medium in, in which on social media people want to interact. So we've created videos and podcasts and you're going to get to see the videos. And then we also, um, I've been writing a fair number of blogs on Walton Insights, some of which accompany the video podcasts and some of which are just thoughts, and I'll show you some examples of those. So in the first um, season, I'll call it, for the Business Integrity School, and we're calling it The Biz, it was a series of nine uh, video podcast that we released, and it was Matt and I really just kind of setting the stage and explaining the basics. And um, we started cutting those, fortunately, in February on campus before COVID hit, which was, it's, that was like a godsend. <laughs> it was perfect timing because only a few weeks later we got shut down and um, Matt and I wouldn't have been able to be in the same room to do that. We started releasing them in May. Um, and since May, we've gotten um, quite a bit of uptake on them, which I'll share with you the metrics here in a minute. Uh, but we've only been doing them since May, and now um, by the end of December, we'll have about 24 total because we've moved on into season two with the beginning of this semester. So let me play for you just a quick snippet here. This is the first one Matt and I cut. Let me get it started, and then I got to go to a time marker here. Okay, so Matt introduces me here at the beginning and he's already done that. So let's move here to a segment of it. Sure. Why is business integrity important today? Well, it's uh, really important in many respects, but it, it's, it almost seems as though it's been normalized in our society right now. So we're kind of this pivotal moment of helping people really understand and what is going on in the news that they hear today and how do they make sense of it? And some of the statistics you've seen lately are a little alarming. In 2018, the number one reason for CEO departures from companies of the world's largest companies, the 2500, was for unethical behavior. That was the number one reason. That was more than poor financial performance and more than not getting along with their boards. And we saw a similar trend in 2019 and those numbers are still still coming in, but it was a, it was a high trend again. And so, again, I think we're just at this point where we've almost normalized unethical behavior, where people can't make sense of all this news that's coming at them so quickly. So, it's a perfect time um, in the time of Walton College when you already have the B ethic values with integrity embedded into the professionalism value to really bring that to life in an entirely integrated. 
a very practical, very experiential approach for students and really all the stakeholders of Walton College. So we go on in that particular video and, and talk a little bit more about uh, just kind of the beginnings of it and how, why we're setting it up so that everyone kind of had a frame of reference. And then the next one, I'll show you just a real clip from, okay, I think that might be the same, yeah. Okay, so then we did this next one, um, which I'll show you again, just a quick clip of, which really explains these six principles that you've heard um, Matt mention, and it's the way at which we went about education. So in the freshman year, it starts with awareness. They just need to be aware of the issues. And we're framing this awareness around six very basic principles of uh, business ethics. So I'm gonna play about a two minute clip of this one, and this would be the second one. So this is um, season one, episode two. Cindy, last time we talked about why business ethics is failing in industry and why it's needed in business schools. And you mentioned these six principles. You've told me about them. Would you uh, mind? Let's let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. So um, part of making business ethics understandable for our stakeholders is to make sure that it's very practical in how we talk about it. And part of making it practical is breaking it down into its most basic and I'd say simple form so that people and uh, leaders and business can find their true north and organize all of this noise in a way that makes sense. And then they can deal with it, right? right. So there are these, these principles that um, a professor at Georgetown, uh, John Haas, as he teaches in the, in the McDonough School of Business there, also a, an attorney teaches at the law school, he really picked up on that Harvard Business Review article that we talked about last time yeah. and took a stab at um, then recognizing what he found were basically five um, business ethics principles that just exist in business today just implicitly have right. existed. There's another one I think needs to be added. Um, and he agrees these five aren't all there is, but these five are implicit. And we'll talk about a sixth one with technology today that, that okay. needs to be added to that list. And that sixth one you came up with through dialogue with Mary Lassie? Yes, right? with Mary, yeah. She's one of the members of the Academic Advisory Board and um, works in the, uh, the Blockchain Center and well-known professor in the information systems area about the technology so pervasive in society today. We just didn't feel like it was one that, that um, could avoid being recognized. Well, you know, these principles seem like a great idea because as a leader, part of the purpose of a leader is to set direction. That's right. And if you adopt these principles or some form of them, then you're setting the direction towards ethical uh, behavior in the organization. Right. So in that video, then we actually go through, Matt and I do, each of the principles and I give a, a recent from the news example of each of them so that people can start and students can start to become more aware of, of what they are. Uh, the technology one is an important one and we're going to visit that one again here in just a minute if I can make sure that I get my slides going to the next. Okay, so I'm now gonna give you just a really quick sneak peek from um, an episode for season two. So Matt and I did the nine in season one. They started being released in May and we went through about July, took a little break in August to get ourselves um, ready for season two. And then we started releasing um, the season two videos and uh, podcasts at the beginning of September. They'll run through December. There's one a week. I've talked to 15 um, different real, um, just, incredible thought leaders in this space about the future of business ethics. So I've talked to professors from Harvard and from um, UVA and from Wharton, um, internationally, from INSEAD, from um, University of London, from just all over the world. And they are incredible thought leaders. And what I'm doing in each of the episodes is really talking with them about what they see as the future of business ethics. The Harvard Business Review article that's still really, really referenced in mainstream stream media um, is this article from 25 years ago where business ethics was being criticized as being taught in a way that was too general, too theoretical, and, and too um, impractical.
quickly. And so much has been done since then that what I, what I really wanted to do is spend this season, this semester, interviewing a number of thought leaders in business ethics to bring that article current and then talk about, well, what's the future? If, if that's what it was, and we know we've made a ton of progress, what's the future going to be? And an important part about the future is ethical AI. This woman here is Kirsten Martin. She is a uh, professor now at Notre Dame. She's an engineer by background and ended up, and she got her engineering degree from Michigan, ended up going on to UVA to get her MBA and her PhD. And she's now really combined those two disciplines into um, uh, being a professor in her field of research and teaching is all about ethical AI and kind of uh, the technology and the next steps in um, uh, where that's going to go into the future. So what I'm going to do is play for you a sneak peek because her episode hasn't been released yet, but hold on. I got to get out of my full screen um, and get to here. Make this bigger. Okay. And now I'm going to play just about a five minute clip. I just want you to hear from her and how incredible she is as exp at explaining some of this. Let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about ethics and AI. You wrote another article about that recently as well in the MISQ executive um, magazine mm -hmm. and how those two um, live together. And what you say in that article essentially is that it's artificial intelligence and algorithms are biased, uh, just mm -hmm. like other decisions that, mm -hmm. that humans make. And so mm -hmm. the question is, as we rely more and more on technology and algorithms, what can we do to make it less biased? Because, you know, there have been a lot of examples of things going really badly wrong with algorithms, like the Uber's right. driving car that crashed, you know, didn't recognize the human form outside the crosswalk, you know, the right. black man that was charged with a crime that he didn't commit, right. multi-facial right. technology, right. you know, that right. Apple Pay card. I mean, who, who knows for sure whether right. or not they were making appropriate credit determinations, but there were arguments out there that they weren't and that people right. attempted it with, you know, men and women who had the same backgrounds, um, but the men got more credit than the women did. So what do we, what do, we do? What is your, what did you have to say about that in your article? And where yeah. do we go here? You know, I think, I think some of the mistake is, so, well, I shouldn't use the word mistake because I use mistake, the word mistake in that article all the time. So part of the issue that we're dealing with right now is that we see these types of mistakes and, um, and, and what we should, as, as uh, anomalies, like almost surprised that they are occurring. And I think just like every other human decision, because it's really just an AI augmented decision, there's still humans that are working at the company, yeah. that these are going to make mistakes. The problem that we have as a business is that they're made faster and they're also made um, so the impact is larger and it's more likely they'll get caught. So right. that's part of the problem. So if you imagine, if you imagine a whole bunch of people asking for credit, um, taking the Apple case, or I mean, the easier one might be like whether or not you get insurance, just depends on the insurance industry. But there were a whole bunch of insurance agents, all not really coordinated, barely they have the same policy manual, but they're all spread out across the nation. If you have a few that are biased, you know, it's it's gonna um, it may be a problem, but it's it, there's also gonna be some that are not that biased, and so it's gonna not just exactly wash out, but it's not gonna be so prevalent. Yeah. The problem that we have is what this does is it centralizes the bias and it codifies it. So now everyone's on the same page as to what the quote right answer is, and so that's why we see instances of this so much more is because it's more uniform. Everyone's getting the same treatment. Um, so if we at least step back and think that AI is not this panacea to actually get rid of bias. In fact, there was an HBR article that literally said, you want less biased decisions, use AI. And I was just kind of like, so that, but that's the wrong answer, only because it makes us think that the decision doesn't need governing. Right. So when we have humans, we're constantly checking to say, did we let the right people into the university this year? Did the right people, were the right people hired? Um, you know, how well did we retain these people? It, when it's human, we always know it's fallible, so we're constantly looking over our shoulders and thinking, are we making the right decision? How can we check to make sure that we made the right decision? Right. So in some ways, that article was just asking the same level of governance that we do over humans, you've got to have the same level of governance over AI. And be thoughtful about, like, the computer programming that you're putting to say, okay, mistakes are going to happen. Which mistakes do we prefer? Do we prefer a false positive? I hire someone that I shouldn't have. Or do I prefer a false negative? I let someone go that I should have hired. And that, that, that changes based on each context. Sometimes even in a hiring decision at the early stages, 
you want to let more people in, right, for diversity and inclusion. But at the very end, you really don't want to hire the right person. So in the end, to say you're wrong. better to defer to like the false negative, to say, look, I, I let the wrong person go, but I'm okay with that. So mm-hmm. it just is to say that there the types of mistakes, one, mistakes are normal, and we should expect and predict mistakes and just assume they're going to happen. And the question is more, how do I identify a mistake when it occurs, make sure that I have an apparatus to check, how do I judge to whether it's a good mistake or not, do I prefer it to the alternative? And then finally, how can I correct the mistake so it doesn't kind of get in this vicious feedback loop where I'm just, right. the mistake is being compounded over and over again. And oh. Kathy O'Neill had a great book on this called The Weapons of Mass Destruction, M-A-T-H Destruction. But the main takeaway of that book was that sometimes this AI, can, um, what it feeds on itself with machine learning can actually create bigger problems than we had before because the bias decision is feeding back in to train the algorithm and then it kind of goes on from there. The main takeaway was that mistakes are normal, you know, they're expected, and an unethical decision is one where those mistakes are not governed. So right. we have to talk about the governance of those decisions, not whether or not it made a mistake is being wrong. Yeah. Mistakes are common and yeah. predicted, yeah. and so we just need to talk about the governance of it. Well, it's certainly... So she, um, that was an incredible conversation. I, I hope when that one's released that you will all uh, go out and listen to that. It was about 30 minutes of just incredible um, conversation with her all about ethics and AI. It hasn't been released yet, but she is up, I think next week is when it's going to be released. And so if you uh, have, go follow the link on my website, you'll be sure to, to be able to get access to that. And so just so in addition to the, the thought leadership on the videos and the podcast, we've also written a number of blogs. Um, these are just three examples of some of the writing that I've done that you'll be able to find out there on um, Walton Insights. You'll see right here, one of them was five practical tips about the ethical use of artificial intelligence. That one in particular talked all about um, governance and how it really shouldn't just be seen as an information systems or an engineering project anymore. That's just not going to work in the future. Uh, okay. Another one was all about speed speaking up and creating a speak up culture, which that's, that's the foundation for any, any um, program around integrity. So the other thing I just want to show you really quick too, is we also do have monthly newsletters. If you go to my website, again, there's the, the um, link to it. It's in the chat. You can sign up and I wanted to just show you. So, okay. So what would that look like? Let me just show you real quick, a couple of examples that I have pulled up here. So if you don't have time to follow all of the um, social media, which can get a bit overwhelming, what we try to do is um, summarize some of the most important things in a monthly newsletter that you can get. So at the beginning of each month, we talk about what happened the last month. So for example, in October, we were just kicking off our Let's Talk program that I'm going to explain to you in just a little bit. We were just on the precipice of kicking off um, a case competition with two of our students um, who participated in a case competition in uh, Arizona. And they on their own came and said, we really want to do this case competition. Fun story behind that. They ended up being roommates and didn't even know that the other was interested in doing it until they got connected on the email I sent them. Um, We were super excited to also be able to get a sponsorship from this one from um, an alumni here, Ken Allen and his wife, Liz. And so we were super excited to be able to have that sponsorship for that case competition. And thank you, Ken. I see you here today joining us. And then we also um, talk about some of our podcasts and get people and you can listen to it right here. You can watch it. And then we give them, you know, some uh, um, highlights on trending articles that I've written that are out there. Uh, in social media and then talk about some of, I always try to every week or two put out some picks, you know, fun things that have ethical dilemmas that I'm reading or watching or listening to. So we give some um, fun examples that way of, of things going on in um, the monthly newsletters. You know, this month, just really quick, I'll show you where I'm going to tell you about Ijeoma, who's going to be speaking here next week. This is all about series two, um, se- sorry, season two of the podcast. This is uh, somebody I interviewed from NCAD, tells you the others that I've interviewed, UVA, Penn State, um, 
uh, Dirk Matten from International as well, highlighted the case competition um, one more time, a speaking engagement I did, and then some other picks. So they're just, it's a fun, quick way for you to stay connected if you're not able to um, obviously keep up with all of the social media, although doing some of it is fun. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you guys a chance to engage in some of that. While I'm getting it back up, let me just pause for a minute and see, does anybody have any questions so far? If, I was John? Just say, feel free to raise your hand or just you can unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat. Uh -huh. And I'll, while you're thinking of your questions, I'll just ask, Cindy, how many people are already signed up for that newsletter? You have a pretty good following already? We do. We have over 400 that have signed up for um, the newsletter already. And it, um, I think it was only our fifth newsletter this month that we put out. So, yeah, we have Great. a lot. And I'm interested in your, your podcast series. Who else is on the schedule that you've interviewed so um for series two we spoke with um mary gentilly from the university of arizona we talked to talked to ed freeman um from uh university of virginia uh he's really kind of considered the one of the the godfathers of the whole um ethics field really big on the stakeholder uh theory which he kind of uh, came up with, if you will, in the 80s, and it just didn't pick up any steam until the Business Roundtable recently changed their statement on the purpose of a corporation. Um, Tom, Tom Donaldson from um, Penn, um, Linda Trevino, again, from Penn State, um, Laura Spence and Dirk Matten, they wrote um, for Europe, the most widely publicized and used um, business ethics book over there. So a real wide range. Eugene Soltis from Harvard, who's written an interesting book called Why They Do It, all about um, senior executives, 50 of them, and why they um, kind of committed their crimes that they did. Next season, we're going to complete the circle and we are going to have interviews with um, not academics, but folks in the business field about what they see as the future of business ethics and what universities need to be doing to prepare students better for um, their life once they get out. So it'll kind of create that feedback loop. I'm getting views from academics now about what they see as the future of business ethics and then next semester we'll get it from um, business practitioners about what they think the they need to see in their students and that'll create a feedback loop for um, the faculty. It's a great lineup. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat now from Sarah. In the future, do you anticipate rolling out this program to other colleges on campus? It's, it's a Walton program now. Will it grow to be a university program? Yes, I believe that it will. And in fact, we're, we're um, starting small with that this semester because there's going to be a, a case competition that Lockheed Martin is sponsoring. This is their fourth year to sponsor it. And we are partnering with the School of Engineering to put a, a team together. The IS department and the Department of Engineering is going to put a team together to go compete in that. And so, yeah, I do believe that it will. The program like Let's Talk that we're talking about this fall, which is about racism and discrimination and harassment and how to use your voice, that applies to the university at large. And so we've invited everybody from the campus and actually from the whole U of A system to participate in pieces of that because the topic is broad. It doesn't apply just to business. Many of it apply, much of it applies much more broadly than that. Great. Uh, one more question. This, this question might be worthy of an entire uh, coffee talk itself, but how has uh, COVID impacted business ethics and integrity? <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, yes. Um, that could take up many hours of a podcast itself. Um, so many ethics issues have come out of it. And in fact, that is where, if you can hold on for just a minute, I'll, and I'm going to let you all engage with that. So you can, you can um, through uh, some polls and see what I'm doing on social media, look at how I've integrated some of those ethical issues about COVID into the program for the stakeholders to be able to um, engage with me and others and talk about how it has affected uh, ethics. 
Okay, so we, I'm super excited about this next thing. What you're going to see is how we have tied together all of this thought leadership that we're putting out there in a way that it can benefit the students directly and in a very practical way and in a way that will make a difference when they're out looking for an internship or for a job. And we've done all that through this suitable app, which is a career readiness app. And um, what it does is it lets the students actually get verifiable linked, uh, they call it a LinkedIn certificate because that's the way it shows up on LinkedIn. We call it badges internally. Students achieving milestone badges. And they do certain things, certain activities, which I'm going to show you here in a minute, um, so that they can complete the activities and get these badges. And once they do, they will then have that as a verifiable LinkedIn um, certificate, or they could show it on their resumes. And what a great way for them to be able to show future employees, employers, that they get it. They understand business integrity and actually have put effort toward it. It's a really hard thing to interview for. Those of you who've interviewed know that very well. But for a student to be able to show that they have engaged on that topic, I think will really help to set our students apart from other universities. And by the way, many of the folks I've been talking to, the thought leaders from the other universities and my podcast, I've been sharing this idea with them and none of them have anything like this. And they really think it's a, it's a real game changer for the students. So I'm going to show you a demonstration and then we're going to get to how you can interact um, with it and see how the students actually do it. So there is this app here. Uh, we've just rolled this out actually last year and this year is the second year of it there aren't a lot of badges the two the one that i've created is one of the first but this is an app so i'm showing you the desktop version but it's available for students on their phones which is where they use it primarily and so what happens is they get into this suitable app and we call it again sam students achieving milestones and then you can see what um you know what badges they could go get here's the business integrity badge and so if a student wanted to get it they would click on it they would then go into the badge itself and i have designed it so that there are a certain number of required activities and then some optional activities i'm going to click into some of these here but what you're going to see is i've made the required activities um, engagement with me on the different social media platforms and then they have to leave some thoughts and reactions about it and upload it into this suitable app um, which keeps track of it. And so um, part of it is engaging with those, those videos that I just showed you or listening to a podcast and then they have to leave their reaction. That's an activity. Um, they've got to go read a blog or two. Uh, I showed you some examples of that. Then they've got to upload um, what their thoughts are on it and they have to complete a certain number of those. And then if they like an activity, they can do more optional things. So let me just show you some of it. So they would click on it. Okay, so let me show you first of all the what this is here, these are the competencies that each activity would build. These came from the great work that Karen Boston and Anna Leary Kelly did. They went out and talked to a number of our employers and said, what are the competencies that some of our the young uh, folks that you're hiring from our college are missing? What do they need to be better at? They came up with 12 competencies. And so all of these activities and the badges are built around building those competencies uh, for the students. And so you can see here, this one is critical thinking and problem solving. It helps them with communication, helps them with career management. Well, what is it? It says follow. So what is this activity? Well, you would click on it, a student would, and it would come up and it would say, join the Business Integrity Leadership Initiative Instagram community and learn about uh, the integrity issues in the news, mainstream media and books. Take a screenshot of Instagram showing that you're following the account. So that's a really easy one. That's like just getting their toe wet, right? They, they love Instagram. What we're saying is if you want to find out about this initiative, you got to engage. So go follow the initiative, prove that you did it and upload that. And so then they would add that to their portfolio. Then if you go down further, hold on, let me get back to it and I'll show you just a couple of more real quick. So you get the idea. Uh oh, did it freeze on me? Let me see. Let's get this party started. They get very competitive. I'll tell you, I've had over 1,100 students already um, start on their badge 
And about, about a month ago, there were, um, let me see, we had about 28 students that were already 25% done. So one of them is go, go to the website, sign up for the newsletter, then they have to engage, follow me on LinkedIn. We'll talk about the Let's Talk program in a minute. Um, here's a really cool one. They have to go try out your own knowledge. So they have to find a business ethics issue in the current event ideas, because I post them on Instagram, I'll show you here in a minute, or find their own, and then write uh, a description on how they would resolve it and why, and then they would get to be considered for a guest post on the initiative's Instagram page, and they'd get to be featured on that. And so they would, this is where they write their reflection, and then they upload it, and then it is, it is captured for them um, in their, uh, in their portfolio. So here's one, read a LinkedIn article on my LinkedIn page, um, read a Walton Insights blog, watch a video. So I try to get them to engage across a number of the platforms. Um, and what I'm going to do now is show you how they actually do that on Instagram. But before I do it, I want you to uh, answer a poll, some of the poll questions, because it won't, I want you to do it yourself, and then you'll see how the students do it, and um, you'll see how they engage. So, Jenna, can you put up the poll that we had? Okay, so, actually, take, pull it down for just a second. Let me just show one more thing. Can you do that, or does that does that kill it? Don't pull it down yet. So, you'll see here my Instagram page, and here are some little buttons for highlights, right? And so the students love this. They get to click on like stories that only last for like 24 hours. And so I will put those up and ask questions of the students that they have to answer. And then I can show them what the results were and explain, make them aware of a business ethics principle. And then we capture the highlights so they live for longer than 24 hours down here. So I'm going to show you, that have you do the poll first, what some of the COVID questions are that I ask them um, and some of the stuff that's in the news. So take a few minutes and go to these questions and read them and just pick what you think the right answer is. And then I'll show you how we do that interactively with the students. So there's some series of questions here on COVID and then there's a few questions on current events in the news. Do you all know how to, or is everybody comfortable doing that? Any questions, John, or advice they need on how to use the, do the poll? Yeah, I think, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but if anyone has a question, you can um, reach out to me in the chat or to Jen B. should be listed in, as an option in your chat. She's the uh, Alumni Association host here, so. So there's some questions on COVID, and then there are going to be some questions on um, in the news. So we're going to go ahead and do both of them now, but I'm going to capture these uh, answers and we'll show you. I can see the results. Can you all see the results on your screens too? Is it coming up or not yet? Not yet. I think they'll aggregate. And okay. See them at the end. Okay. Oh, this is fun to see the results coming in. <laughs> Jen, do we have answers from everybody on it? You think? Most everybody? We've got 78%. Um, okay. Do we want to give just a couple more seconds? Yeah, just a few, because then we have a few more questions to ask, too. Okie dokie. And then I'll be able to post uh, the answers when everybody gets their stuff in. Okay. All right, we're gonna leave it about 10 more seconds. 
And we'll post these and then we'll put up the others. All right, I wanna to get to the other one. So let's go ahead and close that one. It's just meant as an example. Okay, so let's look at this. Should employers install surveillance technology? Uh, one says yes, or 7% said yes, 93% said no. What should businesses focus on the most if they want to establish trust with customers, health and welfare? Uh, one said profit, 4% there. Uh, what do you think is the most credible source for COVID information? You all said government websites as opposed to employer communication. Uh, that was second place. Third was traditional media. Okay. How do you think employees, oh, that should say want to hear, sorry about that, about COVID-19 from their employers, from an email, newsletter, company website, or a phone um, video conference? And then should universities employ virus surveillance technology? Yes, uh, that's kind of split, 70-30. Interesting, should it be voluntary or mandatory? Look at that, that's pretty split. Shows you there's not always a right answer to some of these questions and we're in, the, we're in the wild west of the unknown having to make decisions. Would you feel comfortable using COVID contact technology? Uh, most said yes and some said no. So let me show you how that plays out for, um, actually before we do, yeah, yeah, let me show you that, and then we'll do the one for news, that poll, okay? Let me, let's just do this one first. Hold on just a second. We're going to go, and I'll show you how it works. Okay, so if they're a student, I can't show you live because those only last for, like I said, 24 hours, um, but if it, so we capture it down in the, um, highlights here, which I'm going to show you. Let me just get mine up on my phone. Okay, and so in, we capture some highlights here. Cindy Mori with the Business Integrity Leadership. And it shows them the answer because they've already done it. Perspective on something with you today and to get your perspective as well. So like many of you, I am working at home in the middle of this pandemic. And many employers want to know whether or not their employees are being productive during this time. And so some companies are installing surveillance technology so that they can track their employees' productivity. So I explain it and I go through a little, a little more video for them there. And Here's the other one. Cindy Moore here with the Business Integrity Leadership Initiative. And I want to know what you think businesses should be focusing on most right now if they want to establish trust with their customers. Now, for some reason, that one doesn't show up. But if you can see my phone, you can see that it shows them the answer. See? The answer on that one was employer communication, by the way. How do you think employees want to hear from employers right now about COVID-19? Take the quiz, let me know, and tomorrow I'm going to share with you the answers to all of these questions. That was email newsletter. As universities prepare to go back to school this fall, I have a question for you about whether or not you think they should employ virus surveillance technology. Things like thermal scanners for our body temperatures. So you can see it on that poll, 100% said yes. So the second question I have for you as universities prepare to go back to school this fall is whether or not you think either virus testing or voluntary or mandatory. Let me know what you think and then we'll explore the answers tomorrow. So I do that, and then I, um, like I said, show them the examples tomorrow, uh, the next day. So that's how we do that. Oh. Has caused online credit technology to work. You'd have to enter that Okay, so let me just stop that for a second, and um, let's see. Can you, let's do the poll for, um, uh, for news real quick, if we've got that one. It would just be able to do one or two of those. Do we have that one? Okay, news. Let's do this one. We're only gonna give you about a minute because we're gonna run out of time uh, here in a second and I wanna be able to just show you how we, how we also cover some of the other issues. Uh-oh, that one doesn't work because you, know, you don't understand. Oh, this was the question, the, what was in the video is um, KPMG, uh, the SEC was investigating KPMG because they had a number of employees who cheated on a learning um, uh, exam that they had to do. And so the question I had for the students and others was, what level did they think the KPMG um, employees were who cheated? So that's the question.
and how long do you think the employees then from KPMG, they got suspended? The question was, how long did they think? And then Varsity Blues and both of the above. Okay, so that's good. So you see how that works. And um, then what I did, you're right, you guys got those right. It was partners. Um, and they did get suspended for three years because one of the partners actually tried to cover it up. I talked to him about Varsity Blues. Um, and it was the college admissions scandal. Uh, and then that actually was both of the above. So that, that's how that works there. And we do that and engage with them through um, Instagram and they just absolutely love it. They think that's a ton of fun. So I'm gonna end here in just a second. I talked about the, the case competitions. There are three that we're working on right now. Lockheed Martin is the partnership with engineering. The Let's Talk program, um, we've had an incredible success with this this fall. And what it is, is it's a book series, a workshop series, and then we bring some speakers in. The students are able to get their um, career readiness badges by attending the sessions. And the sessions we made available, not only for the students and the faculty, Faculty, but also through a partnership with Northwest Arkansas Council, we ended up having this great conversation with over 100 um, community leaders. We were hoping to get 100 and we ended up with 120. We had weekly workshops where we go through the different chapters in the book here of So You Want to Talk About Race and um, applied it through a lens of how do you get the courage to actually speak up on difficult topics. And then we had both of these women come speak. Mary Gentili, Ijeoma is coming next Tuesday. If you haven't signed up to hear her, we have over a thousand people who have signed up, primarily from the Northwest Arkansas area. Um, registration for the public is closed. If there's anybody on this call who would still like to attend, please put that in the chat and we need your email address and I think I can probably still get you in. Um, you're not going to want to miss it. She's a New York Times bestseller uh, author and it is an incredible book. Uh, it has really opened up um, conversations here in Northwest Arkansas, really across the racial lines. It's been fantastic. And we are going to keep doing these Let's Fall programs. Sorry, one quick second. We're going to keep doing the Let's Talk programs. They're going to be on different um, topics each semester. So next semester, it's going to be Let's Talk About Fraud. I already have the book picked out from the Harvard professor. Um, we have four different speakers and we're gonna do a workshop. The semester after that, we're gonna be talking about ethics and AI. And I've got the book picked out for that. And you've seen a snapshot of one of the speakers who we're gonna have come, um, Kirsten Martin, and we'll have some others. So every semester, it will be a different topic about Let's Talk. And that Let's Talk component, which is a semester badge they can get, will be is part of getting their overall badge. So a student has to participate in a semester's worth of a Let's Talk program to get their overall badge. All right, that was a lot. Um, and I'm super excited to have been able to share all of that with you. And I'm happy to stay around and answer a few more questions. But how you can help is connect with me and with the initiative. Tell your friends and tell other alumni about it. Connect me with others in your network. And we are um, starting a fundraising campaign and building our external advisory board. Um, so we're looking for contributions there as well. There are individual components of this program that I've just showed you that you can sponsor, like a season of videos and podcasts. Um, there are events and teams that you can sponsor. Um, for the students, there are activities that you can get engaged in. Um, but I will tell you that the best way to see this continue is to get to a point where we can set it up as an endowed um, initiative and center. The one from the uh, University of um, uh, Notre Dame that I showed you where Kirsten's at, they just got a $20 million commitment from a big company for that center. Um, out at BYU, um, uh, the Sorensen family just contributed $40 million to that university's ethics center. I'm going um, a bit uh, uh, less audacious than that and looking to get to actually build um, uh, and get enough an endowment for about, have it be about a total of 10 million. I know it will take a while to get there, but that's what we're committed to aiming toward with a combination of different sources and how to get there starting small with getting folks to just volunteer to contribute a little bit of money or sponsor an event or be on the advisory board and then building from there to the larger um, go get. But that's about what it takes with um, being able to, to survive off like 4% of the endowment to be able to 
make it something that um, is, is, is permanent and doesn't have to be sort of hand to mouth in terms of finding funds to be able to continue to operate. And then the initiative can focus its full time on doing this great programming that I've just shared with you. So I hope that was uh, informative and interesting and fun and engaging, and I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Thank you, Cindy. We did have one question. Uh, well, is there a plan for professional certification or executive education as there in this program? Yes, there is. And we are building that out as well. And in fact, the Let's Talk program that I just shared with you, the community component of that, they are going to get a LinkedIn certification themselves for having participated in that workshop. If they participated in, you know, 90% of, um, of it, then they're going to get that. And then we're working with Brent and Blythe and others in exec ed to take what we've built this fall and what we're going to be building in the future um, semesters and turn it into something that can be more or, uh, of an exec ed certificate. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we're over time. As Cindy said she'll stick around in a minute, but I just want to say thanks to the Alumni Association. Thanks to all of you for joining, and thanks, of course, to Cindy. I think you can see the passion she has for this and the, the depth that we've already created in such a short time for the college and our students. Uh, yeah. Excited about all of this. And reach out to me via email directly if you want to continue the conversation. If you've got to run, I get it. But I am more than happy, as John said, to talk with anybody about it. I'm very passionate about it. Thanks, everybody.